Our Sunday study of the book of Hebrews continues today in chapter 1. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, being made so much better than the angels, because he hath received a more excellent name than they. Remember the story of the Pharisee in the temple. He stood and prayed, Oh God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers. And then, to convince himself, he looked around and saw a tax collector standing in the far corner and said, or even as that publican. And of course, by that comparison, the man did look good, at least in his own eyes. A couple of years ago, the sports pages told us how the American track and field team won the Pan Am Games. They beat Tobago and Trinidad and Aruba and Antigua. They beat Tobago? Well, perhaps they did. But that comparison is not convincing. The author of Hebrews wants to lift up Christ before your eyes. He knows that Christ has many rivals in your life for your respect and your devotion. But he does not fool around with any false comparisons. He makes mention of the brightest and best beings that were ever created. The angels, wisest, strongest, spiritual, and immortal, and says that Jesus is even better than the angels. Sometimes, in a moment of honesty, we may say, well, I'm no angel, and we're not kidding. Angels we are not. We people are only people. Or sometimes we might say to a person who stood by us in time of trouble, you are an angel. And that's not bad. The woman Abigail once threw herself between David and a foolish act of vengeance he was about to commit that he would regret later. And David looked upon that woman as an angel sent from God to protect him. The angels are spiritual, personal beings who were created sometime during the six days of creation. A good guess is on the fourth day, when God created the other heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The angels are God's messengers, for that is what the word angel literally means. Now, the angels are mentioned on the pages of the Bible from the first book, to the very last. Their work is best described by that vision that Father Jacob had at Bethel long ago. In his dream, he saw a ladder reaching from earth to heaven and angels ascending and descending upon it, bearing up our needs to God and bringing God down God's help to us. You remember the passage from the Psalms. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. 
Our text tells us that the angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who shall inherit salvation. It was one of the first lessons and the love list that we learned in childhood about the guardian angels. Jesus says that the angels that watch over little children do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. And on the other end of the spectrum, when we come to the end of the line and our good fight of faith is fought, then shall the angels perform for us their final function. The man Lazarus, covered with sores, lay at the door of the rich man's house begging for crumbs from the table. Jesus preached his funeral sermon and said, The beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The author does not belittle the work of the angels, nor does he deny their excellence. But he does see that the, even the angels cannot compare to Christ on two grounds. Jesus has a superior name, and Jesus has a superior nature. you got to know that in the Bible, names usually stand for something. Abraham and his wife Sarah waited long, long years for the birth of a child. And when a baby was finally born to them, they named him Isaac, which means laughter. And why not? For he became the joy of their lives. The daughter of the Egyptian pharaoh found a little boy in a little boat by the river's edge and she named him Moses, which means drawn out. For she said, I drew him out of the water. And when the woman Naomi returned to Bethlehem, from another land where she had buried her husband and then her two sons. She said to the townsfolk of the village, Call me no more Naomi, which means pleasant, but call me Mara, for I am bitter. There are seven quotations in this section before us today. In every case, we can overhear the Father speaking to the Son. For to which of the angels did God ever say, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The angels are God's messengers, but Jesus is God's son. Has an entirely different standing with the father, unique, close, intimate, of the same nature as the father. My mother, for example does not speak to me or of me as a seminary graduate, a Lutheran pastor, and certainly not as Reverend Parcher. I am and will always be to her a son. My son, she said. The angels stand to God in a creator Cre creature relationship. Jesus stands to God in a father-son relationship. 
And that is entirely different footing from any official office or function. So the angel Gabriel told Mary of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee, and therefore also that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Third quote, and again, when God bringeth his first begotten into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. The angels pay Jesus homage. They did so at his birth in Bethlehem, singing over the plains nearby. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And they still do, as John tells us in the book of Revelation. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, whose number was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The angels adore Christ openly and unashamedly. And of the angels, he says this, he maketh his angels spirits and wind and his servants a flaming fire. Just as the four winds and flaming fire are servants to God, so the angels do his bidding. Now, we talk about angel choirs. The Bible talks about angel hosts, armies. And one angel ain't a bad soldier. Remember the angel of death that went out into Egypt at the midnight hour of Passover? Or the angel that destroyed the armies of Sennacherib, which had surrounded the city of Jerusalem? One angel shut the mouths of the lions in the den where Daniel had been thrown. And there is that great scene in the New Testament where an angel awoke Simon Peter, led him out of his chains, out of his cell, out of his prison house in the dark of night. Noble servant. Nobly serving are these angels. But to the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever, and righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness, and therefore God shall set thee above thy companions and anoint thee with the oil of gladness. No angel was ever called God. No angel ever had an eternal throne. No angel rules in the hearts of men with righteousness. And no angel was ever anointed by the oil of God's gladness. And listen to this. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And by thy hands were the heavens made. They shall perish. But thou remainest. The heavens shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture thou shalt fold them up. Like a garment they shall be changed. But thou art the same, 
and thy years shall never end. The sun was there before the foundations of the world were laid, and before the heavens, which are the work of his hands. But the heaven and earth as we know them are wearing out. They're getting old. They're running down. But we have an unchanging Christ in a changing world. Permanent, abiding, and eternal. And lastly this, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool? The answer, none. God never said that to any angel. But he did appoint his son as both Lord and Christ. People, there's a lot of geniuses and wonder workers out there. A lot of experts and authorities and counselors and confidants and dear family members and trusted friends. But none of them are angels. Not one of them can do for you what God's Son can do. You tell me, who else can answer our deepest longings and aspirations? Who but the Son of God is worthy of our confidence? Who else in heaven and earth has the name above all names? an unassailable character who is unfailingly steady and dependable, who has a unique relationship with the Father, who is devoted to our interests, and who has decreed the ultimate triumph over all his enemies and our enemies. Sin and Satan and death and grave. Who can teach you as Jesus has taught you? Who can do for you all that Christ has done for you? And who can be to us what Christ has ever been and is to us? Amen.